Welcome, I'm Katherine Hadro, and this is EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. A pro-life win, a new HHS rule protects healthcare professionals from being forced to participate in abortions, we discuss. Exclusive from the Vatican, the president of the Vatican's Pontifical Academy for Life tells us his thoughts on the George Floyd protests and upholding the sanctity of life. And be a light. Leah Darrow hosts a virtual summit for Catholic women, which includes a pro-life speaker lineup. Hear about this effort to bring light and hope amidst darkness and despair. The Department of Health and Human Services finalized a rule last Friday protecting healthcare entities that receive federal funding from being required to provide or pay for abortion. HHS stated it is enforcing Section 1557 under the Affordable Care Act by returning to the government's interpretation of sex discrimination according to the biological definition of sex. This clarifies that the federal definition of sex discrimination under the Affordable Care Act does not include abortion. The finalized rule protects a doctor's right to object to abortion and gender reassignment surgery. This news is being viewed by pro-lifers as bringing Obamacare regulations into compliance with long-standing conscience protection rules. Joining us now via Skype is Prudence Robertson, communications associate for the Susan B. Anthony List. Prudence, welcome back. This HHS rule change got a lot of attention because of the impact it will have on transgender policy. But the Susan B. Anthony List calls this a pro-life victory. Can you explain why? Absolutely, Catherine. This is a victory for conscience protections for the American people. What this rule does is it clarifies the definition of sex discrimination not to include abortion. And this was very necessary because during the Obama-Biden era, the administration attempted to redefine sex discrimination to include abortion as a civil right. And abortion is not a civil right. It, in fact, you know, involves the killing of an unborn child and the taking of an innocent life, that fundamental right, could never be classified as the civil right of another person because it denies the unborn the chance to even exercise and enjoy those civil rights. And, you know, furthermore, children are often snuffed out by abortion because of a disability. And while we're fighting to protect these unborn children, it's very important that we continue to state the obvious case that taking their lives could never be characterized or classified as a civil right. So we're very happy and pleased that this rule has been mm -hmm. finalized. Can you tell us more about how this rule change will specifically impact healthcare providers? Sure, absolutely. So now that the rule will go into effect and be enforced, sex discrimination can never be used as a basis for abortion coverage through health care. And that's very important because you and I know, Catherine, abortion is not health care. It is, in fact, the opposite of that. And uh, that's the specifics of what this will do. Mm. Prudence, why is conscience protection a crucial part of pro-life policy? Can you speak to that? Absolutely. Um, you know, as I said before, ab abortion is the destruction of an innocent human life. And people, especially healthcare professionals who believe that that is true, should never be forced to have to participate in abortion in any way. You know, we've seen examples of this in nurses like Kathy DiCarlo and a Vermont nurse from the University of Vermont Medical Center who were both forced to participate in abortion against their will just because um, you know, that these industries wanted to make a profit off of abortion and the, the, uh, their supervisors had no respect for their moral beliefs. And at the end of the day, conscience rights are a fundamental aspect of implementing pro-life policy. Um, and it's crucial that while we're fighting to end abortion on all fronts, we stand strong on the issue of conscience because we owe that to the American people who have deeply held pro-life beliefs that should be respected. Prudence, I also want to get your reaction to news this week that Planned Parenthood formally endorsed Joe Biden for president. What do you make of this endorsement? 
You know, Catherine, it's no surprise, unfortunately, Joe Biden, since he announced his candidacy, has been pandering to the abortion lobby. And, you know, for nearly 50 years, he supported the Hyde Amendment, which kept taxpayer, which keeps taxpayer money out of abortion. And now that he's running for president, he has flip-flopped, and he advocates for late-term abortion through the moment of birth, paid for by taxpayer dollars. So it's no surprise. And uh, he really is alienating key voters that are going to be essential to the outcome of this election. Meanwhile, we have President Trump in the White House, and he is um, the strongest pro-life president we've ever seen. With him, we've seen pro-life promises made and kept. And that's why we are working hard and encouraging every pro-life voter to get out to the polls in November, because like Planned Parenthood said in their endorsement of Joe Biden, this is a life and death election. You know, the lives of innocent unborn children are at stake, and Joe Biden would strip away every pro-life protection that President Trump has worked hard to promote. That was so ironic that Planned Parenthood called this literally a life and death election. Thank you for that analysis. Prudence Robertson, communications associate for the Susan B. Anthony List. Thanks, Catherine. Glad to be here. The Hyde Amendment is long-standing federal policy banning the use of taxpayer dollars to pay for abortion procedures. It's historically held bipartisan support. But there are reports Democratic leadership is working to remove crucial Hyde protections from coronavirus relief funds. It is imperative any relief funds created in response to the coronavirus pandemic are protected by the Hyde Amendment. These funds should be used to fight COVID-19, not to pay for abortions. That would be a tragedy on top of a tragedy. And that brings us to this week's call to action. Go to ProLifeWeekly.com to urge your members of Congress to ensure the Hyde Amendment is applied to all COVID-19 relief funds, including funding for health insurance plans that could cover abortion. Here's all you have to do. At our website, you'll fill in your basic information so we can tailor a letter to your specific lawmakers. It is crucial COVID-19 relief funds go to those impacted by the virus, not towards paying for abortions. Send your message by going to ProLifeWeekly.com. The president of the Vatican's Pontifical Academy for Life exclusively tells EWTM ProLife Weekly, Catholics should replace the word race with the words brother and sister, and that the only response to the violence of George Floyd's death should be nonviolence. Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia shared these exclusive remarks with us in response to the massive U.S. protests that have followed the death of George Floyd. He also this week gives us insight into how Pope Francis is thinking about these very issues being discussed in the United States. 46-year-old George Floyd's death has sparked a wave of ongoing national protests after a white officer knelt on the black Minnesota man's neck for nearly nine minutes until he became unresponsive and died on Memorial Day. Protests in response range from peaceful and prayerful to at times violent and chaotic throughout the United States. This U.S. situation has even caught the attention of global leaders. During his Wednesday general audience on June 3rd, Pope Francis mentioned George Floyd by name, saying, quote, I have witnessed with great concern the disturbing social unrest in your nation in these past days following the tragic death of Mr. George Floyd. The Holy Father continued, saying, We cannot tolerate or turn a blind eye to racism and exclusion in any form and yet claim to defend the sacredness of every human life. Following these remarks, we at EWTM Pro-Life Weekly reached out to the president of the Pontifical Academy for Life, Archbishop Vincenzo Paglia, to hear more about how he views George Floyd's death, the resulting discussions on race, and how it all fits into the Catholic vision for building up a culture of life. We first asked His Excellency for his response to the killing of George Floyd and whether he views racism as a life issue. Paglia tells EWTM Pro-Life Weekly, Catholics need to rethink how they view and discuss race. I believe that a jolt of conscience is fundamental for the word race to be banned. We must replace it with the words brother and sister. As in a family, actually, the brothers and sisters are always different. And diversity is a treasure. 
They must not fight each other. They must not exclude each other. They must not eliminate each other. Racism is a perversion of culture and for those who believe it is truly anti-evangelical. We are all brothers and sisters, fellow citizens of the city of heaven as the Apostle Paul said. Christians and those who love humanity must ban the word race from their vocabulary and replace it with the words brother and sister. Considering a number of protests in response to George Floyd's death have resulted in even more deaths and injuries in the United States, we then asked Archbishop Paglia how U.S. Catholics should respond to George Floyd's death in a way that upholds the sanctity of life. Here's his response. The response to violence is always non-violence. The fight against racism must be carried out through non-violence. The U.S. has the bright example of Martin Luther King. I was a boy back then, and he was a strong testimony for me. Vision of non-violence enthused us. In India, Mahatma Gandhi showed that one can change the world without violence through peace. In Rome, we have the example of St. John Paul II, who forgave the man who had tried to kill him. And finally, given that Pope Francis has addressed George Floyd by name, Archbishop Paglia tells us even more about how the Holy Father views what's currently happening in the United States. I personally know that Pope Francis is very worried about this virus of violence and racism. Because the USA has a great weight and responsibility towards the world. Yours is a great vocation. You have been a bastion of democracy. You have played an important role in Vatican Council too. You have always promoted religious freedom. The Pope asked the whole church, Catholics, Christians, to bear witness to the power of the gospel of love. So that it defeats the diabolical power that divides and leads to the murder of brothers and sisters. Pope Francis remains a great witness of peace and solidarity so that they can assert themselves everywhere and the United States plays a crucial role in the whole world. We continue this discussion about race and the sanctity of life with Gloria Purvis, host of EWTN Radio's Morning Glory. Gloria is also a pro-life speaker and chairperson for Black Catholics United for Life. She joins us via Skype. Gloria, welcome. I've heard you speak Thank on you. what it was like when you saw the George Floyd video for the first time. Can you tell our audience about that, what that was like and how you responded? Well, it was quite a traumatic experience to watch a person, the Imago Dei, have their life snuffed out right in front of you. It was so visceral. I felt myself with my hands, even though I wasn't even there, I felt myself trying to push the officer off him just to let him breathe. And I felt just this, this desperation. And uh, it's something I'll never forget. And for those who are pro-life, it was like watching an abortion and being powerless to do anything about it. Mm. That's so powerfully said. Gloria, we just heard what Archbishop Paglia, the president of the Pontifical Academy for Life, said about George Floyd and the resulting protests here in the United States. Gloria, how do you see this discussion about racial justice fit into the greater pro-life picture? Can you speak to how it goes hand in hand? I mean, it's the gospel imperative to protect the vulnerable and the oppressed. Both movements are animated by the same thing. And so I, I don't understand how anyone would see, oh, you could either be pro-life or you could either be for racial justice. 
You should see this as you're for the gospel and you're gonna follow Jesus wherever he takes you. And that can be in both movements. It doesn't mean it's either or. We can walk and chew gum. And I think we need to understand that our gospel is not limited to a political party, is not limited to a particular movement. Our gospel requires us to follow Jesus Christ wherever that may be. And the racial justice movement is about the dignity and respect of the human person, just like it is a movement. The pro-life movement is for the dignity and respect of the unborn. They are the same movement. We believe in the dignity of the human person from the womb to the tomb. So these movements are animated by the same thing. They're not enemies. They're twin sisters, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gloria, can you speak more about how racism attacks the dignity of human life? Oh, my goodness, it speaks directly against the word of God. We read in Genesis that we are made in his image and likeness, but racism lies. It says that God is a liar, really. It says that, no, God, not everybody's made in your image and likeness, and not everybody is worthy of dignity and respect. Only a few people are. And that is contrary to the word of God. And who speaks contrary to the word of God but the enemy himself? And so we cannot be deceived by the glamour of evil or whatever it is the Satan wants to seduce us and whisper in our ear about our, our fellow uh, brother and sister in Christ. Oh, they had a criminal background. Oh, they were drinking and driving. Oh, they used to rob people. We cannot do that. There are no throwaway people. And the very judgment we pa pass on others, we must remember we could have that same judgment passed on us when we stand in front of Christ because none of us are perfect. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of his glory. And so we seek his mercy. And so we should have the same approach about anybody else. That's the one thing that I have found troubling is I see people who know better use the same arguments that I see coming out of the pro-abortion movement to dehumanize the unborn. They use the same, same arguments to dehumanize our fellow brother and sister in Christ. We cannot do that. We cannot do that. Wow. What role, Gloria, do you think video is going to have on this conversation about racial justice? Oh, I mean, I can't yeah. help but think about how much of a game changer seeing ultrasounds were when it came to teaching people the reality of abortion and the sanctity of our unborn brothers and sisters. We are just such visual people. Do you yes. think videos that capture racial injustice and instances of police brutality will be a game changer for this discussion as well? It makes it so concrete when you see what happens to the image of God in your brother and sister, when you see the police beating someone, when you, when you see the police demeaning someone, when you see the police yelling at someone, when you see the police murdering someone. It makes the, mm. the theory or the what seems like, oh, so distant and far away, so close right in front of you. And it should elicit something and those of us who are believers in Christ, it's just elicit some concern, some horror, some what can we do? We never want this to be done again. It should move us. And I often think that the Lord does these things so that we have no excuse. We can't look away. He's saying, this is what's happening to my children. Do something. Just like we should be do some, doing something for those children that we can see through the ultrasound. We should be doing something for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are being brutalized. You know, and we, we have the visual evidence. Mm -hmm. We can't look away. The truth is in front of us. We cannot deny it. Gloria, I'm interested in asking you about this. Just what are some practical and concrete ways that Catholics and pro-lifers can respond to George Floyd's death, but in a peaceful way and in a way that upholds the sanctity of life? Well, number one, I would say don't share any kind of videos. There was a very popular video going around that really, to me, was odious and antithetical to our Christian values. It engaged in calumny of, about the black community and then detraction about George Floyd. I would say don't share those things. Instead, what you should do is go to prayer. You should be offering reparation for the gross injustice that we saw happen against this human person and offer it for anybody that has been treated thusly. We should be praying for an end to police brutality, which involves more than just killing a person. It's also the psychological terror that's put upon a group of people. All those things, we should be praying to, to act against it. And then we should be looking at ways to get involved with our local Catholic conference. Each diocese just about in the United States has a Catholic conference that lobbies. We should be involved in saying, can we lobby on issues that could reform policing? Things like uh, looking at the police contract to get rid of 
Um, anything in a police contract that hides misconduct or allows them to rehire officers who have been fired previously for brutality and, and excessive force. We should also be looking at how is our money spent? Are there things that could be maybe given to social workers to help prevent violence instead of just having police always go out on mental health checks and things like that? Maybe that should be for someone else and let the police deal with the more serious crimes. There are lots of ways Catholics can get involved, but I definitely want to say prayers, number one, interior uh, conversion, and then action with your uh, local Catholic conference. These are ways that we can get involved, we can do things. And I'm also trying to get together a group of people who are willing to do prayers for the reparation for the sin of racism. And if anybody's interested in that, they can email me, Black Catholics, the number four, life at Mac.com, Black Catholics for life at Mac.com, because we know some demons only come out through prayer and fasting. Well, prayer is key, isn't it? And Gloria, just yes. finally, while I have you, can you speak more about how the pro-life movement and racial justice do go hand in hand? You spoke about it a little yes. earlier. Can you just expand a little bit more on that? Of course, both movements in the United States, really, if you think about it, are dealing with the legal brutality against the human person. We have abortion is legal. And then we have a system of qualified immunity that pretty much doesn't hold police officers accountable financially. And so these things enable the kinds of behaviors we would not want to see. And so what we're going to do is we're going to try to change policies in both cases. We're also going to try to change heart. Both are about the dignity of the human person. One is the dignity of the person in the womb. The other is the dignity of the person outside the womb. This should be a no-brainer for Catholics. This should be a no-brainer for people who want to follow the gospel. Now, I will say this. Following Jesus is not easy, but we are called to take up our cross and follow him into Good Friday so we know that Easter Sunday is coming. If we say we believe in Jesus, mm -hmm. if we say we believe in the gospel, if we say we believe in scripture where we're all made in his image and likeness, that means there are no throwaway people. And this should animate us to understand that both the pro-life movement and the racial justice movement are twin sisters. Easy. Gloria Purvis, host of EW10 Radio's Morning Glory. Thanks for being with us this week. Thank you, Catherine. Coming up, a major abortion lobby releases a report on the media. We speak out against NARAL's biased media analysis. Welcome back to EWTN Pro-Life Weekly. I'm Katherine Hadro. The pro-abortion group NARAL released a report this week accusing major media outlets of bias against abortion. That is this week's Speak Out segment. <music> NARAL Pro-Choice America released a report titled Accurate and Unbiased, a Deep Dive into How the Media Covers Abortion in the U.S. The abortion lobby claims it shows major media outlets parroting, quote, disinformation-based rhetoric from pro-life voices. The report objects to media coverage of abortion as, quote, a political issue, not a health issue, and claimed that charged rhetoric from anti-choice advocates are included in coverage, oftentimes with minimal context. Take a look at this. The report even issued guidelines for the media on what terms to avoid because they claim they are, quote, emotionally charged. Terms like infanticide, born alive, or abortion industry. Week after week, we've shown examples of pro-abortion bias from some media outlets, but apparently that's not good enough for NARAL. They want even friendlier coverage and even less scrutiny. That's a sure sign they are not telling the truth about abortion. In an attempt to win the abortion debate, they've resorted to trying to explain journalism to journalists and try to manipulate language used in media coverage in their own interest. Fortunately, here at EWTN News, we are not willing to accept lectures from pro-abortion groups on how to do our jobs. Amid event cancellation and social isolation right now, Catholic speaker Leah Darrow has found a way to bring women together this weekend with the world's largest virtual conference for Catholic women. The Lux Summit 
features a long lineup of talks from Catholic pro-life female voices. Darrow hopes to inspire all women to be a light in the world right now, no matter your path or vocation. When it comes down to it, um, my tombstone won't say founder of Lux. Hmm. It'll say mama and it'll say wife and like and, and daughter of God. And I think that's <laughs> I think that's honestly where we as women struggle so much because we think that we have to have all these titles and statuses to feel like we have to really contribute and to be renewed in Christ or to follow him. And my sisters, that's just a lie from the devil. Our contribution is this beautiful feminine heart that God the Father has created us in. And it is to be fully us, is to be fully you. That was part of my conversation with Leah Darrow earlier this week for a Facebook Live event on EWTN's Facebook page about the Lux Summit. The Lux Summit includes talks from other Catholic pro-life speakers, including Live Action's Lila Rose, Patricia Sandoval, and yours truly. Darrow created this innovative summit to bring light and hope during times that can feel full of darkness and despair. I know I'm looking forward to this Catholic community this weekend as we come together to build up a culture of life in our home and in our world. If you want more information about how to join and watch the talks from the Lux Virtual Women's Summit, just go to theluxsummit.com. That does it for this edition of EWTN Pro-Life Weekly coming to you from the Hadro home. Until next week, we'd love to hear from you. Find us on social media at EWTN Pro-Life on all social media platforms, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, we're there. But if you prefer email, you can always send us a message by emailing prolifeweekly at EWTN.com. We'd love to hear from you. And remember, life is a gift. Your life is a gift. God bless.